You're listening to The American Scald, a musicology podcast. You know, I wrote a whole damn thesis on Grieg's work in Norwegianism, almost 100 pages, on topics ranging from early Norwegian nationalism to folk song collecting to the language debate to independence, and not once, in any of my sources, did I read a single word about Alea Kroger, or even Camilla Collette, two women who collected and cultivated the very melodies and stories that Grieg would make famous around the world through his music. Now, mind you, Grieg is not implicated in this, as he was simply drawing from Lindemann's published collection, and Kroger died when Grieg was very young. But it was Lindemann who learned these melodies in particular from Kroger, and published them in his collection of mountain melodies under his own name. Further, Camilla Collette was one of the most important informants of Asbjørnsen and Moe's Norwegian fairy tales, Norway's own Brothers Grimm if you'd like to think of it that way, which inspired and nourished the creativity of Norway's whole golden age of art as we call it. Now, I'm not one to pass judgment especially when transposing modern values onto people from 150 years ago. It's like shooting fish in a barrel and then giving yourself a fishing world champion medal. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in moving forward, and finally giving these two women their due in the narrative of Norwegian music history with what little material I have to work with, for I wouldn't have many of my favorite piano pieces ever written if not for these two remarkable women. Olea Kroger was born July 17, 1801 in Hedal Telemark, now known as Nottodin. She pretty much spent her whole life living in Telemark, aside from some short stays in Christiania. She had to be homeschooled by her parents, as was the norm in the Norwegian bourgeoisie, as girls were not allowed to attend high school. From a young age, she demonstrated talents in the arts, especially music, and gave private lessons in singing. As a young adult, she would lead and teach the choir at the local teacher training school. Life became increasingly difficult for her, though, for after her father died, she was left with two sisters to run the farm with Kroger taking on much of the land work. According to her brother-in-law, the apples from her orchard were, quote, the best in the village. But we didn't come here to learn about Kroger's apple talents, as interested as I may be in that. For as I alluded to earlier, Kroger was one of the first people to systematically collect the folk songs and melodies of Telemark, and thus she is now counted as one of the few women who are part of the national breakthrough in Norway at this time. While we don't know when she started collecting these tunes, it was as early as 1842 when she first requested publishing from a firm in Christiania. Being a woman, the publisher gave her a lot of pushback, so she had to ask the local parish priest Tonazen in Nisadal for male assistance. The best he could do was send a letter stating, Norska Folkeviser, collected by a Norwegian lady, reviewed and provided with the necessary glossary by Pastor Tonazen, as well as with melodies by organist Lindemann. Thus, her work would only be published under Lindemann's name, with herself only referred to as Norwegian Lady. This would happen a second time in 1844, when she wanted to publish even more melodies, but they instead had to be incorporated in Magnus Landstad's Folkeviser, another important source for Grieg and others, but this wouldn't be published until 1853. In the preface, Landstad writes that his work was encouraged and supported by a lady who, quote, has a lively interest in the cause. The music appendices are due in no small part to the priest's daughter, Miss Olea Kroger, who has a significant share in the establishment of this collection." End quote. Throughout Lonstad's work, there is evidence through handwriting, etc., that up to half of it is made up of Kroger's work. Through her work, Olea Kroger set a standard for Norwegian women later into the 19th century. Whether she meant for this or not, she was beginning to break down the idea that women were meant to be housewives and not concern themselves with the more noble academic pursuits of men. Olea's passion and motivation simply drove her to do whatever it took to fulfill her vision, and for her to travel around Telemark alone to collect folklore and folk tunes was unheard of for a woman, and it inspired generations of Norwegian women to rise above the traditional expectations. In spite of all this, at least in English, Olea Kroger is not remembered much in the history books because of her reliance on men to publish her work, but much work has been done within Norway by academics to place Kroger as one of the most important figures in Norwegian music history, due to the crucial role she played in the folk collections which Lindemann and Landstad published. And today in Hedal and Seljord, you can visit monuments built in her memory. Now, before I wrap up this tragically short episode, I'd like to take a brief moment to shed some light on a prominent author named Camilla Collette. Despite being an author, I feel obligated to introduce her to the narrative of Norway's music history due to how important her stories were in the literary sources for romantic composers in Norway. 
Camilla Colette was a direct contemporary to Kroger, working primarily through the 1840s in collecting folk stories. And plot twist, she was born Camilla Vergeland. For those here who are more savvy with Norwegian literary history, you may recognize that name from the famous Henrik Vergeland. And yes, Camilla was indeed related. She was his younger sister, and his biggest rival, in a typical sibling sort of way. If you'd like to know more about Henrik Vergeland, then look forward to episode 6, when we learn about Ola Bull, who was a close friend of this famous poet. Back to Camilla Colette, like Kroger, she also received the bulk of her education from homeschooling, though she did have a few years at a girls' school in Christiania as well. She was also well-traveled, joining her father on frequent trips to Germany, and even spent some time living in Hamburg and Copenhagen. After she married one Peter Jonas Colette, the two of them had a mutual passion for folk tales. So together, they set to work collecting and writing down as many as they could find. Around 1842, the same years Kroger was working with Lindemann and Tonesen, Camilla and her husband collaborated with Asbjørnsen and Moe, again Norway's Brothers Grimm. Colette and Kroger were even mutually helping each other in an indirect way through Asbjørnsen and Moe, as they used Kroger and Colette's snippets of the song Ostenfor Sol of Vestenfor Molna to create a complete song, and her work was used in Moe's collaboration with Lindemann for his own set of melodies. So now, you can see how all of these figures were collaborating and working together throughout Western Norway for the mutual goal of preserving and cultivating a distinctly Norwegian literary culture. But all too frequently Colette's name is left out even despite her wealthy background and incredible legacy left behind as one of the most prominent authors of 19th century Norway. In a perfect world, this episode would be far longer, but the reality is that I have far less material to work with due to the nature of the subject. But it is my hope that someone out there may be motivated by something found here in this episode to shed even more light on the legacies of these important figures in Norwegian history. For it is with all of these figures that we've talked about thus far, Camilla Collett, Alea Kroger, Valdemar Thrain, Ludwig Matthias Lindemann, Asbjørnsen and Moe, Longstad, and so many more, that we see the first signs of romanticism and folklorism making its way into Norway's national conscience, and I don't think even Valdemar Thrain could have predicted the sort of reception and passionate interest his work would ignite for future composers, musicians, and poets alike. While most of Norwegian romanticism for the next century would owe its heritage to Thrain's work primarily, more concrete interactions between art and folk music which fueled much of the Romantic era would not have been possible without the works of these incredible men and women who dedicated their lives to the cause of their homeland. And so, friends, that wraps up this week's episode of the American Scalds Musicology Podcast. If you'd like to support the show, be sure to leave a review, subscribe on YouTube or your podcast platform of choice, or leave a tip on my website, theamericanscald.com, as I do all of this for free. Also, be sure to share this with others who may be interested. Now, I'm currently sitting at eight five-star reviews on the Apple Podcast platform, up from seven last week, and I'd love to see the number hit ten, again of any value, for I want them to be genuine. Remember, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube under the same name, and if you find yourself becoming enchanted with Nordic art music, be sure to join hundreds of us over on the r slash Nordic Sound subreddit. So, as always, thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The American Scald, a musicology podcast. Mm -hmm.